Hello everyone and welcome to this Citrix and Microsoft technical session on migration strategies for Citrix DAS on Azure. My name is Alcina Walters Sandy and I am a worldwide partner enablement manager here at Citrix. Today I am accompanied by our presenters Kevin Nardone, Director of Customer Success on the Americas Enterprise Architecture team, and Oscar Rodriguez, Senior Sales Engineer within the Desktop and Application Group at Citrix. We are also fortunate to have joining us today some subject matter experts from the Microsoft team as well. So feel free to post your questions within a GoToWebinar toolbar at any time throughout this webinar, and we'll be able to address directly. So let's begin. Kevin and Oscar, handing it over to you for introductions. Perfect. Much, but yeah, quick, you know, intro of myself, and yeah, thank you so much for having us on the call, you know, Oscar and myself. Uh, you know, I work for our enterprise architecture team. I manage our team in the Americas. We kind of really focus on helping customers align people, process, and technology to their business outcomes. So we're pretty often with our partner community, our customer community, kind of really be at the tip of the spear, especially when it comes to Citrix on Azure strategy. Oscar, would you want to say a little bit more about yourself as well? Yeah, so I'm one of the sales engineers that's working with the service provider team, really assisting our partners to help their customers uh, drive the adoption of that virtual environment, Citrix Cloud as well. And so this is a great conversation to, to be on with uh, partners. And definitely, especially as we go through the conversation today, um, we're going to kind of hit on a few things and we're going to really try to frame it in the context of in an Azure project. Microsoft has a methodology known as the cloud adoption framework. Great, just like just core, like how do I do cloud, whether it be DAS, whether it be, you know, app refactoring into like platform as a service, whether it be kind of just expanding into different geographies, et cetera. There is a great methodology in terms of how do you take your business from start to finish in terms of that cloud migration. And on the Citrix side, we like to align with this framework as well, because one, it helps you know, us you know, collaborate with Microsoft. It helps us engage platform teams and kind of speak the same language. So as we go through the discussion today, we're going to kind of walk through the strategy plan ready and adopt phase in the context of a Citrix project, hitting key principles within the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework. Now, as we kind of go through the discussion today, we'll definitely make sure we kind of hit on like lessons learned from a partner business strategy. Like Oscar mentioned, he is, you know, I'm leading our uh, part of our service provider program. I actually historically used to be one of our architects uh, for that team as well. So I have good just, you know, business development experience as well as like customer facing project side. So we're going to make sure as, you know, the partner community, we kind of weave in some of those customer as well as business opportunities uh, as we go through the discussion today. The next thing, you know, it gets into like where does Citrix fit, especially when it's being deployed on Azure with, you know, Azure Virtual Desktop with, you know, core Linux applications in the context of a customer's environment. You know, Citrix Cloud, Citrix DAS is that control plane. It's really where, you know, from an administration perspective, you're doing most of the analytics, image provisioning, brokering, uh, session connection, policy management, especially in the context of the security of that session. And you're, op you're operating and orchestrating a customer's or your service provider Azure subscription tenant. So when it comes to how Citrix hooks in, it is hooking into a customer's set of workloads, a customer's infrastructure, their Azure subscription, their Azure governance, their Azure landing zone, bringing it towards some of the methodology used by Microsoft in the cloud adoption framework, as well as having the extensibility to connect into also on-premises resources, other cloud providers, multiple geographies within you know, multiple Azure data centers, multiple subscriptions. So as like a partner, like especially interfacing with your customers, you know, Citrix Cloud as that additive ma management plane, you know, building off of some of the core capabilities or like enterprise multi-session Win 10, uh, Azure Virtual Desktop as a program rather than a technology, you know, pulling the, the ability for customers to bring their own licensing, get those uh, entitlements in terms of client OS licensing, you know, Windows 10 multi-session within their Azure tenant, and then using Citrix to broker, manage, and distribute those connections securely from a DAS standpoint to your end users. And like, where does Citrix fit, especially as you're building a, you know, virtual app and desktop, desktops as a service practice, or kind of driving, you know, with your customers through this cloud adoption framework as a joint Citrix and Microsoft partner, you know, Citrix really adds, you know, three core areas of value. And we're going to hit on each of these in the discussion today as well. First, there's really about mitigating risk. You know, as you move through a cloud adoption framework or go and strategize, 
those projects with the customers. You know, cloud projects are also very dynamic. They're they're fast. You know, we can fail fast. It's agile infrastructure. You know, let's use an agile methodology. Let's you know target a single use case, take it to the you know rest of the business, build our cloud, consume it, and then orchestrate it. So evolving our processes over time. Now, as you customers go through that process, you know, requirements may change. There may be third party integrations that are required. There may be, you know, changes in device framework, changes in IDP. So from a Citrix perspective, especially when you think of things like app migration, moving, you know, a core application database, you know, or web backend that, you know, Citrix might be just, you know, providing that client securely from on-prem to Azure, that's going to take time. If you're talking, you know, moving from a radius-based authentication to like a SAML IDP, such as, you know, ping, Okta, you know, Azure AD directly, you know, that's also a project component that is going to take time, sometimes lumped in at the front end of a cloud infrastructure project, sometimes, you know, captured later down line, especially if the customer is looking to get out of the data center business, for example. So Citrix is like full features and functionality and just completeness of solution. We really kind of add a lot of integration points above and beyond core Microsoft to kind of help drive Azure success. So being able to support other IDPs directly or like bring your own authentication, being able to drive like single sign on with, you know, a SAML based authentication using things like Citrix Federate authentication services, more granular policy control, broader, uh, you know, broader capabilities around audio video optimization beyond teams, especially looking at other collaboration solutions such as Zoom, you know, Google Meet uh, or, you know, Cisco WebEx or things along those lines, or being able to support a bevy of additional devices. You know, you look at things like Chromebooks, for example, and, uh, uh, you know, they penetrate, you know, the education business and some healthcare in some instances, you don't want to stall an Azure project because of like a device dependency that can't be met with the native uh, Azure virtual desktop solution. So from a Citrix perspective, we really help mitigate that risk, you know, drive the, the necessary you know, peripherals, you know, app requirements if an app needs to stay on prem and kind of really provide uh, hybrid multi cloud capabilities that allow enterprises to really accelerate or just kind of you know, drive that migration, drive that cloud value without letting some of those dependencies block a supposed project. Another big bucket as well, and we'll kind of really get into this in the plan section, is you know redu reduction of cost. You know, from a Citrix perspective, you know there's robust image management solutions, the ability to control and deploy persistent or non-persistent workloads at scale. You know, built-in monitoring tools for IT admins such as that Citrix Cloud Console or your help desk administrators, especially if you're working across your know, large help desk teams and you need to manage sessions, check VDI performance and things along those lines. There's also a lot of built in tools around you know, bandwidth optimization with the ICA protocol and being able to provide a robust user experience with low bandwidth requirements or you know, robust user experience across you know, large latencies and things along those lines. And then on the compute side, you have like things like auto scale, being able to control uh, load, being able to control capacity based on schedule or like set, you know, schedule, CPU, memory, et cetera. And using you know, non-persistent workloads, it really opens up the capabilities to do you know, ephemeral storage or you know, simplify your storage footprint by using things like Citrix provisioning and pushing out over the network. A lot of these concepts will cover during the plan phase because understanding and how you optimize your cloud costs and using the tools available to you as well as some design tactics will really drive success. And then the third bucket is really delivering that secure experience. You know, there's built in capabilities such as like session recording as part of like the uh, Citrus licensing capabilities such as app protection, protecting against screen scraping, key logging, and then being able to do this with context. Uh, above and beyond, you know, uh, core, you know, Azure conditional access, uh, de uh, device endpoint analysis, you know, uh, network location, geofencing, uh, et cetera. You can control the, the policies of the protocol. So like locking down clipboard, locking down USB, granularly to like the type of USB driver that you're using or the type of text that you're putting within your clipboard, you can control that context based on who the user is, where they're connecting from or what they're connecting to. And you can do it in a way without sacrificing user experience, so improving you at, uh, your user experience while delivering a secure experience in the process. And without going through, you know, each of these buckets, 
you know, the Citrix and Microsoft partnership is strong. We are continuously working together, continuously innovating to mitigate risk, reduce costs, and improve user experience for our customers. I uh, definitely recommend, you know, reviewing the What's New page. We tend to roll out updates monthly. You know, big increases such as a 150% increase of our per uh, VDA subscription scalability, availability, availability zone support, Azure Compute Gallery support, you know, things such as, you know, the Azure VMware solution, dedicated hosts, looking at Gen 2 images, uh, there is going to be, a, there's a consistent stream of innovation and Citrix Cloud is the best platform to deliver an Azure set of workloads in the, the DAS or virtualized application space. We think of customer motivations and especially as you're working with your customer community as a partner, or for example, hosting and being a service provider, say for example, for an ISV app or like a general purpose desktop for you know medium to small business and things along those lines. You know, Microsoft within the cloud adoption framework really hits on a series of core customer motivations, whether it be the reduction in capital be expense, being able to kind of move your data center into the cloud, shift it from a CapEx to OpEx, maybe taking advantage of like a hardware refresh and being able to do it incrementally instead of like a large capital spend, maybe optimizing your capacity in the process. Citrix can accelerate initiatives such as that. So for example, what if your devices on, you know, your endpoint devices also need to go through a hardware refresh, not just your infrastructure. Could we move them to lower cost devices such as thin clients, things like iGel, HP, Dell, or like I mentioned Chromebooks before, or you know, with that added security such as session recording, security analytics, uh, app protection, could you then initiate a BYOD program, kind of really facilitate employee onboarding and offboarding with you know, hybrid work and things along those lines, accelerating that Azure value uh, using Citrix Cloud. Other big opportunities, divestitures, M&A, you know, driving security and compliance, you're providing more segmentation and separation uh, for end users, especially if they're third parties and kind of being, you know, going from that untrusted space into potentially trusted and protected assets. So there are a lot of opportunities as a partner to kind of drive and build additional value within some of your services projects using both a Microsoft Azure as well as a Citrix Cloud platform. As you know, customers look at these motivations, it then gets into the use case. You know, what is that first use case that we're going to deploy that drives that business value that hits the technical motivations that are kicking off, you know, that Azure project as we go through the cloud adoption framework. And, you know, what you see on the screen are a lot of the common ones, you know, oftentimes, you know, VDI, uh, virtual apps, virtual desktops, whether it be, you know, that device replacement, like I mentioned, getting out of the data center, Citrix is often that first use case. You know, uh, in the cloud adoption framework, Citrix would be considered an app. You were building off your Azure landing zone and then building that Citrix landing zone so that as an app, it can scale and then drive additional use cases using your Azure infrastructure. So having conversations with your customers around what's the motivation, what's what does this use case provide to the business? What is the workflow, device, peripherals, application requirements? You know, these are questions you should always ask on every the front end of the project. Or, for example, if you're looking at scaling out to additional use cases, integrating them, whether it be net new or current uh, use cases on prem, integrating them into Azure. And this is, again, really where that feature, that comprehensive integration of use case dependencies really shines. Like I mentioned before, with identity, being able to support multiple IDPs, you know, device requirements, peripheral requirements, where is my application data going to sit within this use case? You know, maybe there are key applications within an office desktop that have like on-prem dependencies you know why would you want to derail potentially you know a lot of value in terms of driving additional capacity in the cloud while an application sits on-prem you know why don't we virtualize that app to that virtual desktop in azure get some of the benefit and walk into the cloud based on that your customers or that project's overall requirements from a timeline perspective so now that we've talked about the architecture a little bit we're going to walk through what citrix cloud looks like from an admin perspective so as you saw on the previous slide, you know, especially when it comes to like the Citrix Cloud Console, you know, a lot of your management experience is going to be done through the Citrix Control Plane and through integration into your Azure subscription or uh, individual data center. Uh, this is typically done by establishing resource locations, whether it be you know, multiple Azure regions across one subscription, multiple subscriptions distributed across regions, as well as like your on-prem uh, infrastructure. Uh, as you can kind of see here, the architecture and the components that are deployed 
in each of these different you know, hypervisors locations in a hybrid multi-cloud fashion is fairly consistent. And uh, you know, the main piece being like the cloud connector. This is a Windows-based server of uh, size, you know, about four by four vCPU, eight gigs of RAM, and it'll have the Citrix cloud connector software on it. And that's something that's maintained and updated by the cloud service. Uh, thinking through the cloud connectors, especially with it being maintained via the service, you can control the you know maintenance windows on a resource location by resource location basis. And this is typically this then aggregates into you know where your your workloads are, like what you're connecting to from a hypervisor perspective. And we'll kind of walk through what that looks like in a virtual app and desktop context. You know, one of the first things you'll do too as well, you know, after you have those cloud connectors established, is drive that integration into your infrastructure. Uh, from an Azure perspective, we use an Azure service principle, something that can be you know, uh, put with least privilege using role-based access control and with the permissions that are the minimum required permissions uh, to the subscription where you're deploying your Citrix workloads. Um, as you can kind of see here, you can deploy on a host connection by host connection basis. And you can also deploy and connect to multiple types of hypervisors and cloud infrastructures. So giving you control in terms of where are we starting from a migration standpoint, if you're an existing Citrix customer, you can go, hey, let's start with Azure with Citrix Cloud, eventually swing over our on-prem, you know, start and integrate into our Azure environment, our on-prem environment first, you know, think of it as like a parallel Citrix site and then integrate Azure. Again, a lot of control in terms of where your apps are, where your infrastructure is, and you can then bring that all together from a deployment migration standpoint. A next big piece from that host connection tied to a resource location is a machine catalog. This is the, the same concept as an Azure virtual desktop host pool. It's a specific configuration of OS resourcing, uh, image configuration, Citrix uh, virtual desktop agent, our agent that sits on the machine. You kind of aggregate it into a specific template. You can control and kind of on a template by template basis, you know, take the same image. Maybe you want to then allocate different resourcing to it. Uh, that's something you can then control based on your use cases. You can also map, you know, Citrix workspace environment management configuration sets. So, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later, which then can, can control things like policies, profile configuration, resource management, and things along those lines. Uh, you could have multiple OSs here. So another risk mitigation standpoint as well as maybe you have a like legacy app, legacy desktop that has to sit on-prem. Uh, you need to deploy Linux. You have to have multiple versions of Windows or like you have server-based OS use cases, client-based OS, single session, multi-session. Uh, so a lot of flexibility of control based on the infrastructure necessary for your use case. And then each of these would then be tied to a resource location. These funnel into what's called a delivery group. So thinking of you know, your migration strategy, maybe you want to take a machine catalog from on-prem and a machine catalog from Azure and funnel it into the same like use case. A delivery group is a, a use case is an easy way to think of what a delivery group is and how it would be used uh, within your deployment. These delivery groups act as like you know identifiers for policy filtering, policy control. Uh, you can segment out like you know, hey, I want to give specific applications. I want to deploy the desktop experience from the set of machines, and then you can also even segment that like deployment of a desktop versus app experience within that delivery group as well. Maybe you want to give the admin experience to administrators only, and then publish out a set of virtualized applications to a set of, you know a specific users based on your AD group. And then these apps can exist you know, based on your machine catalog within on-prem or within Azure, giving you the ability to kind of swing over after you go through your digital estate planning. And now with that in mind, you know, let's now talk about you know, some of this architecture and digital estate planning and how it factors into uh, some of the de decision-making and migration to cloud and how you can mitigate risk through the process. So the next piece, especially as you go from your, you know, that going through that strategy, what's the motivations for the business? Why are they looking at cloud? What are our first use cases? One of the great uh, things about the plan phase within the cloud adoption framework is the concept of digital estate planning. You know, what are the app characteristics that fit within this use case? How can we approach these applications uh, as we move to the cloud and move towards the move towards the cloud incrementally? Um, just like you know, Microsoft's guidance in terms of starting incremental, finding a use case with vested stake with strong cloud motivation, and then building from there as your organization uh, gains experience and refines their governance policies, policies, refines the operations, adds new tools uh, as it makes sense. You know, on the Citrix side, we recommend the same. You know, start incrementally, start with an initial use case, and then start building from there. 
And then as you go through the concept of digital estate planning, there are like three different bucket, major buckets that Microsoft uses within the cloud adoption framework. You have the concept of an application that might be retired. Like in the previous example I mentioned before, it, it might have to stay on-prem. We're not going to refactor it. We're most likely going to replace it within a specific time frame. We are going to retire this application. Let's have it stay on-premises until we're ready to get rid of it. And then the use case has that net new app that's been replaced running their VDI or a virtualized version of that new app within Azure. That's where you can leverage things like app virtualization. For example, we want to deploy and virtualize that application from a you know secure context within our data center to that Azure based VDI, for example, on you know micro enterprise multi session Windows 10. Let's not let that hold up the cloud migration. Let's ensure there's performance because it's closer to the backend data or profile uh, profile data for that application so that the user experience is done, so is, is positive and it's delivered in a way that's secure. The next concept is you have is, is re-hosting. So the concept of, you know, this is the concept of lifting and shifting an application um, from on-premises into Azure. Maybe it's a, a server-based app, you have an application silo, and you know what, let's just lift those servers. Maybe what we'll do is we'll kind of take the existing image, let's convert it and make it Azure ready. You know, there are a lot of Citrix tools, especially when we get into concepts like the image portability service, Citrix provisioning, where you can really facilitate that re-hosting. You can maintain those existing operations. Say, for example, if you know, you're using VMware as your on-premises hypervisor, let's have tools Tools that can convert easily that image into an Azure image. So then you could potentially deploy it within your data center within Azure for like say cloud bursting for DR, uh, for example. DR is often another initial use case into the cloud, especially because of some of the cost savings benefits. Don't, ha don't use this data center unless it's an emergency. Hey, let's, let's ship that to the cloud so we can kind of save some capital expenses. And then the next piece too is also like refactoring. Hey, we are going to take this on-premises image. We're going to shift the database to like a SQL service. We're going to move like the web infrastructure to some of the app services within Azure. Let's you know deliver that application using you know Citrix, such as you know secure secure private access, or like let's leverage if you're using Citrix ADC within your data center for load balancing, web application firewall. You know ADC is also software. Let's deploy VPXs within Azure or CPXs from a container perspective, and let's facilitate that app refactoring process by providing the same load balancing web application API functionality, uh, protection functionality that we might be using on-prem. And all of this can be done while also optimizing the infrastructure as a service uh, using some of the built-in tools on the Citrix side. And, and bringing this all together, just as like one example, and especially as a partner and you kind of go through that digital estate planning, again, a great methodology as you look to transform how a customer delivers virtual apps and desktops or applica just applications in general, just securely within their organization using Citrix on Azure. Uh, so you have, for example, you know, taking that retired app, virtualizing it into VDI, you know, locally installing those apps that are being rehosted. Web factor, uh, you know, something that's getting refactored. Let's access secure access it securely from a web browser using Citrix Internet Access or Citrix Secure Private Access within the VDI. And then rehosting, you know, maybe you don't want to have a silo. Let's potentially repackage that app as an MSIX or an application layer and elastically add it to, you know, log on to the VDI reducing your image count. Maybe you, you've challenged some existing assumptions during the process. But Oscar, would you want to walk us through, so going through some of these core planning concepts, there's obviously a lot of great tools that facilitate this uh, for our customers as well as our partners. Would you want to walk through you know, some of those key tools, especially for those that are planning a Citrix on Azure project? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the areas that uh, you know Citrix has been really focusing on the past few years is making improvements, adding features to Citrix Cloud. And in the context of that Microsoft uh, Cloud adoption framework is how can Citrix, how can we optimize and streamline that process to migrate to Azure using Citrix uh, Cloud? So as we, uh, what I'm gonna cover some of the tools that, that we are implemented to do that. So the first one that I'll talk about is the Citrix uh, automated configuration tool. This tool, uh, what it's gonna help you do is to migrate that existing on-prem virtual apps and desktop uh, environment into Citrix Cloud. And here's how it, it does a, a little bit of that uh, I'll cover. So there's a piece of software that you're gonna have on the delivery controllers that's on-prem. 
What's great about this is it's going to review all of the applications, the catalogs, the delivery groups, everything that's inside of that environment. It's going to go through it. It's going to export it into these uh, files, these YAML files, where it has all of those configurations ready to go for uh, import into Citrix Cloud. And this is makes it a couple of things. So it makes it, a, of course, a lot easier to uh, stand up an environment rather than starting from scratch you already have a lot of your you know uh, in, environmental uh, configurations already set up well even better is that you can edit these files so these files uh, you can go ahead and if you want to you know change names or or change uh, different parameters you can do that before you do the Im import so this vastly reduce the the process of migrating a current on-prem environment into Citrix Cloud. So uh, that's uh, automated configuration tool. Next up though, is we do have this image portability service. Sorry, Kevin, can you move slides? <laughs> Next up. All right, thank you. So the image portability service uh, is something that is going to help you again manage those uh, that migration over to, to Citrix uh, Cloud to Azure. So how does it do that? Uh, we all have to, that I think I usually say that's the, the hardest part of, of being a, a Citrix admin is having to deal with the different images that, that I have to stand up and, and keep managing. Uh, and of course, having to migrate it over to, to Azure just creates a whole, you know, a, another challenge there. So what we've done is we've created the service that's going to help streamline that process. So it, it has a couple of steps. Uh, the first step is going to be the export, right? During the export process, you, uh, the, basically the partner is telling the service that they have an image that they currently have on-prem, on an on-prem hypervisor, and they would like to migrate it over to public cloud, right? Uh, during that uh, process, we call our APIs uh, through those connector appliances that you see on the screen and those connecting to that local hypervisor to extract and copy out uh, that uh, information of the image, the disk, uh, and it copies it out to a, a shared local uh, storage location uh, that's on the premise with the partner, right? So phase two of this is the upload piece, and that is uh, you know, where it gets that disk and it's going to send it out to the partner's Azure environment. From there, it's going to prepare this, this disk for whatever environment that it lands in. So we do have you know, um, APIs. We also have some PowerShell scripts that, that we make available. So if you're going to put it on, on Azure, on, on any of these other public clouds, we have uh, a way to prepare those for that particular environment, right? And then lastly, of course, once you have that, uh, which, by the way, when, when it's preparing it, whatever was installed on there for the, the hypervisor. So there, if there were hypervisor tools, it'll remove those hypervisor tools. If it needs anything for Azure, it'll, it'll install anything that it needs specifically for Azure. So, it, again, really streaming, streamline that process of, of migrating these disks over to public clouds. And so all of these are tools that you can... Uh, you know, use during the, the planning phases to figure out how you're going to, you know, uh, optimize that process. So next up is another really great uh, advancement here. So I myself have been a big fan of provisioning services. As a matter of fact, I work for a very large healthcare environment where we had about 700 systems that were all, you know, being run off of provisioning services. And so I, I'm a big fan and it was, we've, there've been some challenges in terms of moving or, or having that available on Azure because again, provisioning services dependent on things like Pixie Boot and so that we needed to find a new way to make that available inside of an art, uh, Azure architecture. So that's where that uh, you, EFI uh, booting support came in because now uh, we have that um, uh, support where we can have a small disk during boot up that just has everything that it needs for PVS and it allows for that provisioning service now on, on the Azure architecture. Great thing about it is that if you are familiar with the PVS 
uh, environment on prem, you will be able to pick up the, the same process inside of our Citrix Cloud version because it's the same wizard driven uh, experience. So same experience as, as on prem um, provisioning server. We also have the, you know, it's going to be an integrated service with inside of Citrix Cloud. Uh, you can um, just know that you're going to have the same type of, of scale and performance that you have out of the current on-prem environment. So I, I know that, you know, both camps of the machine creation services and PVS have their, their different reasons. For me, myself, I was always very happy with PVS and, and how quickly I was able to update a, a disk and get it pushed out into an environment. All right, so next up, we have, we'll, we'll quickly talk about another great feature, and that is the auto scaling that we have built into Citrix Cloud. So if you're inside of a public cloud environment, one of the things that you have to really worry about is how do I keep my, my costs down? I have all of these different uh, systems out there and what happens after hours that are not in use? How can, I, how can I basically power manage all of this? How can I scale up, scale down when I need? And this is something that uh, we've added natively inside of uh, our DAS uh, on Azure so that you can proactively scale and, and power manage those VMs uh, based on whatever schedule that you decide on. Uh, so you can you know, make sure that those systems are up and running when they're needed and they're actually turned down when they're not. So what that does is it's going to reduce costs uh, and make sure that you're not uh, you know, overusing on resources. So this has been another huge improvement uh, that we bring on top of that DAS on Azure. Next up. So this is another great tool that Citrix uh, has in their uh, arsenal because Workspace Environment Manager is not just uh, uh, one tool. It is a whole set of tools that will help you run and increase your performance and increase the user density of these uh, systems, of the VDAs. So I'll go through a, a couple of, of the big ones that I, I find uh, are really important to our partners. The first one that I always point out to um, is the way that it can monitor the CPU, the memory, the IO, uh, on these systems and make sure that no one user can take over the, the entire system. I'm, I'm a, usually have had to do my fair share of on calls. And so a, a tool like WEM really is going to make sure that you have a very stable environment, right? And so it can uh, not only just do that, but it can uh, monitor and, and adjust all of these different th things. I've, I've seen partners uh, not just adjust uh, profiles and, and monitor you know, policies, but their printers, uh, their uh, hard drives, I've seen them using that very heavily. So that, that's just another uh, tool that, that it has built in. Uh, the other one that I find uh, on the right hand side, you see that improve the number of users per server. It can increase the, the user density because it is monitoring that, that CPU, that IO, that, that RAM it can increase the number of users that you end up having on those systems. So again, going to in, uh, make those costs uh, come down because now I can have more density of users in there. Uh, I don't see it on here, but I will mention it as well. And that is log on times. It does improve those log on times. And we can, we can keep it here on this one because now uh, for folks that are not on uh, of Citrix virtual apps and desktops uh, already or on the DAS, the Citrix DAS, uh, we now have this Citrix optimization pack. We're not just, uh, you know, going to stay, that, that WEM tool is so good that we don't have to have it just for virtual apps and desktops or the Citrix uh, cloud. We can actually have that on any customer that has that native uh, AVD 
that uh, Azure virtual, virtual Desktop, we can have that WEM layered on, on top of that so that we can bring those same improvements, same improvements to the, uh, you know, optimizing the CPU, the, the RAM, the IO, uh, making sure that we can increase that user density. So this is the optimization pack that was just released uh, this past month. Um, that is now for any customers that have that standalone or uh, native AVD, we have this available for them as, as well to add on to their deployments. Lastly, we have this, this uh, slide that kind of reviews a little bit. You know, on the tools uh, on the right hand side, it's a little bit of what I just covered. So we have that, that auto scale tool that will help you, in, you know, uh, make sure you keep those costs down. Uh, that workspace environment manager that can optimize and, and, and monitor the CPU, the RAM, the IO. And of course, being able to have things like uh, our, our monitoring tool built in, uh, part of what the is just the, the Citrix job, at least for me, has always been making sure that you can identify issues when they're happening. Uh, you know, if there's latency with a session, if there's any, uh, you know, CPU that's that's kind of gone out of control, that that's where that monitoring tool comes in. And uh, so we are able to really have helped us make sure that they can track down the information they need. But it's not just about the tools, it's also about the design tactics. How am I going to uh, you know, plan on this design now that I have uh, time to, as I'm migrating into Azure, how am I going to address all of the things that that's, may have been issues on my current on-prem environment? So the, the reevaluate existing you know, and, and on-prem on sizing, the idea is that don't just take the, the current issues that you have and then just move them up to Azure. This is the time to make the decisions on what hardware is really required. There's so many different um, options inside of Azure in terms of systems, in terms of storage. You know, do you really need that 200 gig drive or do you want to uh, reassess all of that? So this is the time to, to do that. Um, also, the, the idea of tier services can, uh, versus the one size fits all approach. So the idea there is that um, many times on prem, we may just have the a general purpose desktop where you know we give that out to, to everyone. But that, that usually doesn't work out because there are task workers, there are knowledge workers, uh, you know, somebody that um, is in, I don't know, marketing would probably be okay with that general purpose uh, system. Whereas, uh, which would be a, a good fit for that multi-session type environment. Whereas somebody in engineering would probably want their own desktop VDI one-to-one. -one. And so this is the, the time to sort of address all of that because, because again, Azure gives you so much flexibility on the type of systems that you can bring to your, your customers. The adjust, for, you know, idle and disconnect timeouts, uh, this one, uh, you know, Kevin had mentioned it to, to me before, and, and this is a great one because you don't want to just take that current on-prem timeout that you have. Yeah, depending on what that timeout is, um, the example that, that Kevin had given is, you know, if you have a 60-minute a uh, idle timeout with an eight-hour disconnect, well, potentially you, you may never see those users drain off of the system. And of course, because on Azure, you are paying for, while those systems are up and running, that's where Autoscale comes in. That's why you don't want to just, you know, again, just don't lift and shift all of the uh, current configurations and move it over to that. And lastly, the optimized profiling size and, and, and data handling. So what I would take away from that is, again, you want to look at everything that's being kept in those profiles, all of the information that's in there, because it's it's one thing to keep a profile, you know, folder, user folder uh, on prem, um, but now if I'm having to use that, bring all of those profiles over to Azure, that could mean a lot more storage. So definitely, you know, look at uh, what is in those those profiles, how am I gonna use something like FS Logix? How am I gonna use Citrix uh, User Profile Manager in combination? And not only that, but even with WEM, because WEM can, can make sure to, to kind of uh, set those profile settings how you want.
So all of those in combination can help with that last uh, bit on how to optimize the profile size. So that is it for me. All right, so for our next demo, let's take a look at resource management and uh, see what that looks like. So as you kind of saw from the plan stage, especially digital estate planning, and as you get ready to move towards deployment in the ready stage, we're gonna highlight a couple of the you know, operation and just how like some of the capabilities within Citrix can help you optimize operations and reduce cost. So first kind of starting with provisioning, especially when it comes to just the ability to deploy non-persistent devices. So whether it be, you know, hey, we have a pool set of machines, you know, we just want to do a roaming profile and have our call center agents, you know, be able to consume from a pool of uh, virtual desktops. So as part of the planning exercise, you can then say, hey, we have 300 call center agents. You know, we need 100 desktops at peak concurrency, perfect, because their profiles can roam and they can be shared. We can leverage these non-persistent machines and we can take 300 users and service them with 100 machines. Thinking of further reduction of costs, especially on the storage side, you know, you have ephemeral disk support, you have the ability to stream machines over the network using Citrix provisioning. So there's a lot of flexibility in the provisioning technology to deploy workloads in a way that's going to reduce storage costs and then also drive efficiencies, especially if you can share compute uh, through non-persistent workloads. Thinking of Citrix provisioning, you know, as we kind of highlighted, it's you know a, a component that sits within your like Azure workload subscription uh, and can leverage you know Azure SQL Service, you know Azure Premium Files to stream that virtual machine over the network. Now let's just say I, I set up provision Citrix provisioning, I'm launching my admin desktop, and now I want to manage those workloads, you know, within my uh, Azure subscription. You know, for those who are listening, who are previous Citrix administrators or currently you know, working with Citrix on prem, you know, Citrix provisioning is the same admin experience that you have within on-prem when you're deploying it within Azure. You know, these are my target devices, they're booting over the network, and we're thinking of like that network boot and the, the ability to kind of read uh, a read-only disk over the network and then store writes, for example, within a, uh, a specific write cache, you can drive like a lot of storage optimization. So like thinking of one of my targets here, my OS disk is only one gig, and then all of those writes are then being delivered to that cache. So thinking, for example, if your master image is 128 gigs, like a P10, and now you can consolidate that down to like 32 or whatever your design drives from a write cache sizing standpoint, you can drive significant storage savings at this point. You know, taking your 128 gig per machine and, and siphoning it down to like 32 because you're now reading that over the network centralized within Azure Premium Files. So that's at least on the provisioning side, you know, hey, let's manage these workloads. And like thinking also of like reactivity and being able to adapt to change, one of the other benefits of Citrix provisioning is the ability to drive, you know, reboots or like push out versions across thousands of machines just by rebooting those VMs. So like taking a look, for example, you know, at my machine here, Maybe I have a high rich graphics intense workload and I'm using like an NV4 series machine. You know, we're building the image and we realize, wait a second, um, they are, someone forgot to add that AMD GPU driver. Uh, for example, you can go in here and like, hey, as you're rolling out maybe a new version, you know, getting ready to pilot an image, et cetera, you can go and then change the VDisk for this machine or create like a new version. So I could go ahead and remove this VDisk. I can then have it boot up from V2. So the next reboot, this machine is now going to kind of load up with the, the improved image. And then you can also drive different versionings of VDisks. You can kind of control this in a way that uh, makes sense based on your image management processes. So that's one way to kind of drive and control costs through effectively managing and you know, your provisioning process. Things from a design standpoint to think about, you know, tiered services, you know, thinking of how we provision machines from a core master image, using that machine catalog concept, you can diversify the sizing of those machines. So maybe you have a general purpose desktop, you have workload users that fit into a you know, higher resource profile versus low, you know, let's have that same machine do burstable uh, compute. And then like those people that have a higher end resource needs, let's have them do F series. You can kind of tier that out operationally. It's something I highly recommend uh, you just, you do, you, as you go through your digital estate planning think of the resource utilization because it could drive a lot of efficiencies. So now there's also we've provisioned the resources. Now we want to manage them effectively. 
That's where auto scale comes in. So Citrix, the way we do auto scale is you can control schedules as well as you know load based settings. So thinking of like a multi-session machine, the CPU memory storage and session count on that machine could then be used to kind of understand how much load is actually required and being used within the environment. So enabling auto scale, it's you know out of the box can be done automatically on a delivery group by delivery group basis. You can set those schedules, create new schedules based on like the you know maybe you have a three you know three shifts or you want to kind of control the timing of specific days of the week. Maybe you're in retail and you have different peak demand uh, on a weekend versus during a weekday. You want to control that accordingly. One thing as well from a, a design standpoint, especially as you look towards cloud, is the concept of timeouts. You know, timeouts are critical going from on-prem to cloud because that will also control how you drain uh, multi-session workloads. You don't want to like take a, a four-hour disconnect timer you might have on-prem and then associate that with cloud because that's going to you know control how quickly users can get off the machine during off-peak times. Now, one of the cool things about auto scale is the ability to drive dynamic sessions. Maybe you want to have those similar on-prem timeouts so people can go for lunch, but then off-peak you want to then control it and shrink them so you can drain machines more effectively. So a few capabilities in here, not just like on the automation side, but also to allow you to tweak you know, specific behaviors to drive efficiencies. Maybe you're, you've run a lab environment for, for an education uh, system and you want to force your user log off during off-peak times to kind of forcefully drain those sessions uh, in a way that you can, can then drive the capacity down during off hours when students are in class. You can restrict auto scale from maybe you're doing cloud burst. Again, going back to hybrid multi-cloud, we're gonna auto scale only the public cloud workloads in our machine catalog that's in Azure, and then like have everything up and running within our data center uh, that's you know, maybe on VMware or things along those lines. And then you could burst using auto scale. So again, using that hybrid multi-cloud to one, mitigate risk as you transition, but may maybe drive a DR use case, things along those lines. Now you've provisioned the resources and now you're optimizing the, the management of that capacity. But then there's also the concept of managing and optimizing the capacity and the performance of those workloads. So Citrix also has the capability known as workspace environment management. This is also a cloud service. Think of it as like a, a policy engine where you can apply actions based on certain filtering to kind of apply group policy. But one of the very simple capabilities that is built into the Citrix agent is the concepts around resource management. So I can enable spike protection, that noisy neighbor problem around CPU, maybe with multi-session Win 10. I can control and maybe exclude certain processes that we don't want to do spike protection. I can optimize memory. I can optimize, you know, multi-session, you know, efficiencies. So thinking, for example, you know, I have a session that's disconnected in my multi-session environment. So you've provisioned those workloads, tiered out those services to reduce costs, enabled auto scale, set schedule and load based on your needs with dynamic timeouts to effectively drain resources. And now you want to take the capacity you've provisioned and get more users on that to drive efficiencies. You know, all of these are tools within the Citrix footprint that can help you optimize your operations and then reduce the cost of your overall Azure deployment. Oscar, thank you. And especially like when you think a lot of those things, you know, a lot of those tools are built in, you know, some of the process stuff, it really, as you go through that cloud adoption framework and really prepare and plan for that Citrix project, really uh, challenging those assumptions is critical. And, you know, Oscar, like you mentioned, things like auto scale, like some of the capabilities too around schedule and load based policies like uh, we've seen a lot of customers especially as they go and you know prepare that azure landing zone look at some of their use cases you may or may not you know reserve instances uh for example and, and what you can often do rather than reserving 100 percent of your capacity reserve incrementally and then set your schedule where you know hey if you've reserved 20 percent let's have 20 percent of these workloads running 100 percent of the time and then use the load base settings to burst into that pay as you go so like instances that are running for shorter durations the, the overall total cost of ownership is lower because you're really taking advantage as the pay as you go and you're meeting that minimum capacity. So planning is critical, especially when it comes to preparing your environment, setting up your project and then kind of driving success, especially if you're working with your customers that are ending, entering uh, you know, Citrix on Azure for the first time. You know, the next big thing comes into like the ready stage. You know, we've, you've gone through the strategy. Why are we doing this? How are we going to do it with the plan phase? Now it's like, let's start executing. And now the Azure landing zone is a key concept within the cloud adoption framework that really says like, this is your core infrastructure. This is your quote unquote, your cloud data center where you're setting up your identity governance policies with regards to Azure RBAC policy tagging. Um, 
I mean, tagging policies, you know, uh, what are you doing from a Azure Security Center standpoint? What are you doing from an Azure Key Vault standpoint? How are you connecting ingress and egress from your data center into Azure? What are you doing for firewalling? Are you using site-to-site -site VPN? Are you using an, an express route? So an Azure landing zone is a critical prerequisite because, you know, again, in the context of Azure, you know, Citrix is an app. And while we're a solution that delivers apps, delivers desktops, you know, we need a place to land in order to kind of for customers or for, you know, your own, uh, your own service providing organization to del deliver those initial workloads to deliver those desktops. We will rely on those core services. So some prerequisites, especially as you work with your customers on POCs, pilots, or production use cases, is really like understanding their virtual network. You know, is it mature? Have they kind of planned it out for scale? Is there firewalling in place? Is there a connectivity between the data center and their and their Azure footprint? Um, do they have like the security policies where you know some organizations that cloud data center is considered untrusted? You know maybe they're you're, they're applying higher level security policies against that from an, a data encryption, from an access control. You know are those standards established? Because oftentimes if they're not, especially in an enterprise context, you might not have the opportunity to start building uh, in that environment. So understanding the network maturity. Now there are you know if you, there's ways to think incrementally, right? Especially if you're starting small, maybe they have a site to site. VPN, they were doing some basic testing. Hey, you know what? We want to just start getting a feel for running multi-session Win 10 using uh, Citrix. You know, let's install the workspace environment management agent on it. Again, also a cloud service uh, stored within Citrix Cloud. Let's test. You know, site-to-site -site VPNs, great for POCs or pilots. Uh, Express route is something that we recommend for customers at you know much larger scale, like thousands of users from a production standpoint. So, but in general, regardless of the scale, on-prem connectivity is often needed, especially if you want to have any form of domain presence or domain association uh, from an identity standpoint. Uh, Citrix as well, again, going back to that mitigating mitigating risk, you know, from a workload standpoint, we support many types of identity. Uh, domain joined workloads, non-domain joined workloads, Azure AD only joined workloads, or hybrid joined workloads can all be within the same deployment. So if you're looking at doing some form of, you know, maybe there is no virtual network setup, but you're doing some form of cloud-based enclave for like a dev environment for, you know, third-party developers just to kind of experiment in a sandbox, perfect. Like let's start, you know, running non-domain joined workloads. Let's have them authenticate into Citrix Workspace using, you know, Azure AD or like some other SAML-based identity provider and and like let that let's have them start working with that sandbox environment in like a complete isolation from the data center a lot of capabilities for use cases that might not be feasible uh with uh, until you start moving towards you know citrix on azure but things to think about but identity is also a key prerequisite especially when it comes to that landing zone, you know, what is the identity standard? What are the identity needs of that use case? Another big thing as well is like Azure RBAC, and this goes into the concept of governance. While we don't have a chance to kind of cover what governance uh, means here and in the Azure context at, you know, at length, I highly recommend reviewing key concepts like Azure RBAC, tagging, policy controls, uh, things like Azure automation, applying policies, you know, and, and, um, and initiatives automatically across your Azure subscriptions or subscription groups. A lot of this is covered very well within the govern phase of the cloud adoption framework. And why is, you know, role-based access control important? Because oftentimes, you know, Citrix, again, as a an app in the context of existing and uh, as a spoke off that Azure landing zone, you know, you're going to need to work with the cloud platform team to understand what are their, you know, least privileges and like security con uh, considerations for, you know, privileged access. Uh, Citrix uses an Azure service principle. So say, for example, you know, think of that as like a service account tied to that Azure subscription or things like resource groups or resources for that resource automation. So working with a customer's cloud platform teams, you can leverage that service principle aligning with you know least privilege in terms of these are the, the, the smallest amount of APIs that you need to kind of automate the scale, automate the management of those workloads. Let's only apply it to the Citrix subscription or the Citrix resource groups to go about create, uh, creating those workloads accordingly. Uh, a lot of this is used for you know, non-persistent and power management. Uh, of those workloads, but you know maybe that's still being defined, and, and we just need to connect someone to a desktop. Perfect. You can just spin up a multi-session Win 10 out of the Azure Marketplace, throw on your VDA, test things like the Citrix Gateway service, your authentication policies, get an overall user experience, and work towards that incrementally. Something you want to balance with your customer based on their Azure maturity and their landing zone maturity, as well as the timelines and success criteria of the overall project.
Other key things as well, especially in that ready phase, is you know at administrative tools. You know what changes as you move from on premises to the cloud, or existing operational processes still going to be done? Are you going to you know tweak anything from a policy or resource management perspective? You know Citrix on Azure, it really kind of we we had a lot more capabilities when it comes to just core admin management. You have the you can apply group policy via just native GPOs. You can use things like Workspace Environment Manager and apply actions from a, a drive mapping, printer mapping, applying ready registry keys, you know, adjusting profile policies all within that cloud service, as well as having things like HDX policies in terms of tweaking the protocol uh, within Citrix Studio. Profiles you can control with like Citrix User Profile Manager. We also support FS Logics or just native Windows roaming profiles. And then the load management standpoint, you can balance off session, CPU, memory, utilizing auto scale, util utilizing image management. You know, such as you're using Citrix provisioning on prem uh, and or things like machine creation services natively integrating with that service principle into a customer or your service provider hosted uh, Azure subscription. Uh, also, from a monitoring standpoint, you have the concept of director of Citrix analytics, uh, et cetera. So really kind of adding a robust layer of administrative tools that as you've now migrated and you're starting to operate the environment, are you is anything changing? Are you using some of the existing standards from on prem? Are you optimizing, say, things such as your profile as you kind of move into more of an Azure context during that planning? A lot of features and capabilities are there for you at your fingertips to administer that environment successfully. The next piece is really that adoption phase and like, you know, kind of really covering this at a, you know, simple level is gets into that access layer. How are you using it? Like Citrix, especially with the hybrid cloud, you could really use that access layer when it comes to uh, controlling and shifting those workloads from on-prem to Azure in a way that's transparent to the end user. Deploying out workspace app, aggregating current and proposed state into Citrix workspace or Citrix storefront and Citrix ADC. You can then have your current state, say for example, if your customer or like your service providing organization is leveraging, you know, a customer manager on-prem Citrix using you know standard FMA architecture or cloud management, or you're moving from on-premises workloads into Azure workloads. You can then move use case by use case uh, and add additional workloads into Azure based on the business needs or based on how you scale your business uh, as a service provider overall. And then using things like optimal gateway routing or Citrix gateway service, you can route users connections to the resource location or data center uh, that 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 will best provide the user experience, and then really from there, it then gets into like rinse and repeat. Okay, we have a new use case. Let's go through the strategy phase. Let's plan it out. How do we then onboard it? What is the digital estate plan for this use case? And there are a lot of great tools out there as well, especially when it comes to like understanding the apps a use case might have, whether it be combing through SCCM data. Say for example, if you're moving from like persistent to non-persistent workloads, using things like uh, you know Liquidware or Lakeside SysTrack or from an application compatibility standpoint, you know, Remo 3 is a great Citrix ready tool that can take your applications. Can we make this multi session aware? Can we move this to Windows 10 uh, Enterprise multi session as we look to going from a, you know, one size fits all within on premises? Let's kind of check our application compatibility using that Citrix ready tool to ensure that we can maybe move to a tiered service and maybe use uh, uh, multi session Win 10. And that really then gets into just we you build the use case apply your policies, have users uh, onboard your users and have them start connecting through the Citrix access layer. So a great way to kind of move uh, in, a, uh, in a at a pace that makes the most sense for your business in a way that can you know, drive the most success and business outcomes for that organization. And to wrap it up, especially now that we've talked about migration and like, you know, having, you know, using Citrix access to like drive adoption and move forward through that uh, adopt phase, let's uh, do a final demo on what does the user experience look like? So getting into the migration process, especially when you think of like Citrus Cloud and Citrix Workspace and kind of really moving your users from on-prem to, you know, a cloud-based access, Azure workloads, you know, existing Citrix environment, et cetera. You know, one way to do this is, you know, through Citrix Workspace as well as Citrix Storefront. We'll kind of hit on a few of these things here. For Citrix Workspace, you can control really the authentication mechanism that you're going to leverage. So for example, you know, maybe the your organization's moving towards Azure Active Directory, you're leveraging another identity provider, SAML 2.0, or for example, you want to leverage your existing Citrix gateway on premises using, you know, existing authentication policies, especially if you're with a Citrix, your existing Citrix customer. There's a lot of control, especially as you go through the migration process to kind of one, you know, select this authentication mechanism 
mechanism uh, control how people connect on like a resource location by resource location basis. So for example, you know, connecting into Azure, maybe you want to use the Citrix gateway service, or you want to connect through a traditional gateway that you might have on premises, both of which can be controlled. One of the great things as well about Citrix Cloud is especially when it comes to service integrations. So thinking of, you know, what well, I'm delivering virtual apps, virtual desktops, secure web, uh, you can pretty much turn these services on and off as you're ready to introduce them into the organization. And one of the great things from a migration process as well is those cloud connectors can actually also be integrated into you know, an existing Citrix storefront, existing Citrix Active uh, AD, Apple, excuse me, existing Citrix ADC, uh, in order to you know be able to transition, say if you have an existing footprint on prem. And when it comes to the user experience as well, thinking of you know, all the services that could be provided and you're accessing Citrix workspace through the authentication mechanism that you've selected based on your you know, identity strategy, et cetera, a user can then launch you know, resources transparently regardless of where the location is. And what you're seeing here is kind of the fully featured Citrix workspace, virtualized apps, virtualized desktops, you know, whether it be on-premises or in multiple locations within the cloud, labeled this way, can be controlled based on your needs, files, actions, etc. And then thinking of a different example, like, you know, bringing it back to, you know, our, our you know, conversations earlier, maybe our call center use case, you know, I'm just providing you know, virtual apps and desktops here. Again, I throttle the services integrations that were available in this workspace based on what my needs are. And with that in mind, let's actually bring ourselves to the actual desktop experience. You know, as we can see here, you know, uh, via provisioning services, we've updated to the new version. You know, we wanted to make sure that, you know, hey, as we kind of were talking about before, you know, had the wrong VDIS version, needed to make sure I've installed my GPU. And thinking of, you know, being able to kind of use that hybrid multi-cloud and deliver a secure experience, you could publish those virtual applications as shortcuts. Or for example, a user can access Citrus workspace from within this VDI. So maybe for example, I need to SSH into a control system that exists currently on-prem, and you wanna make sure you deliver this as a virtualized app in a lockdown or secure fashion. So for example, as you can see here, you know, I'm launching this virtual app within my virtual desktop. I have watermarking, I've kind of controlled this. You can also do session recording. You can kind of add that context around security based on who the user is, what they're connecting to, what they're connecting from, device posture, et cetera. And now let's like take a look and maybe do a little bit of a stress test uh, with our GPU. So as we're kind of seeing here, I have you know my GPU. It looks like I'm getting some frames per second. Uh, probably wasn't too quick on the draw on that one. But as you can see, you can really deliver a very robust, rich user experience, leveraging some you know, N-series VMs within Azure, leveraging the HDX protocol. This is running smooth. I mean, it feels like local within my machine, and I'm connecting actually via the Citrix gateway service via Citrix Cloud. So a lot of control, a lot of capabilities for your organization as you kind of move from you know, on-premises and deliver your VDI to public cloud, and especially thinking of the, the capabilities of the Citrix protocol, the control of the policies, it really comes down to you know, building off of that plan, going through that ready stage, and then migrating and continue to innovate uh, within your organization. Now I'll probably kind of jump in here. My teammates might be a little bit mad at me, but yeah, thank you all for kind of taking a look at this user experience. We covered like a lot here uh, today, and there's only so much you can really cover within an hour time. But I wanted to kind of share a couple great resources for you, such as you know how do we you know what is the risk mitigations, you know improving operations, you know improving user experience. You know there is so much more than what we covered today, and there's a great article in terms of what that looks like. What are some reference architectures? How do I you know deploy? Like what are the things I need to think about? Uh, when deploying a, a, a Citrix on Azure, you know, building off of that, you know, Azure landing zone and the cloud adoption framework, for instance. There's also a great blog series about doing this at enterprise scale, like going through key design uh, criteria around identity, around network, around security, around governance, in accordance with the enterprise scale landing zone methodology in the cloud adoption framework. And then there's just a, a great site of just solid resources that's continuously updated on the Microsoft and Citrix Better Together page. But thank you all so much for the time today. And, and really appreciate uh, you all spending some time with us to kind of really double click into some of the technical considerations and business considerations here as you work with your customers to deploy Citrus on Azure. But Oscar, are there any other final comments on your end? Uh, no, other than to say again, thank you for, for allowing us to present. Uh, there is a lot of information out there on those different pieces that I spoke about, the migration tool. Uh, as a matter of fact, somebody on my team is, is uh, managing some of that. 
Uh, so the migration tool, WEM, uh, and, and the image portability service as well. Great, good information out there. Cool. All right. That definitely works. They were cut out for me, but 